Good evening, everyone. Hi, my name is Marie Elise Milius, and I am the co-president of Macaulay Diversity Initiative. Thank you so much for tuning in to our first annual Supporting Excellence Conference. Um, this evening, we will be highlighting student activism, advocacy, and social media. You all will hear from Dean Pearl who, and our distinguished keynote speaker, Assemblyman of District 31, Khalil Anderson, who at 24 made history by becoming the youngest Black Assembly member. You will also hear from CUNY alumni and student activists who are just like you and me, and who have been working so hard to not only open the dialogues of equality and inclusion, but actions as well. Before I hand it over to Dean Pearl, I would click quickly like to thank all of MDI, our eBoard members, to those on our committees, um, student development, especially Chelsea, for all the help that she has put in to make this event a success, career development, the Scholars Council, Dean Pearl, our CUNY alumni, our panelists, and of course, our keynote speaker, Khalil, and his team for making this virtual conference possible. Thank you. So I just, just I noted because I was foolish with the mute button. I wanted to thank uh, um, thank you all for, for inviting me to speak. Um, I especially want to thank the Diversity Initiative for developing the theme and goal of this important event. The members of the initiative have really breathed new life into this, the annual Supporting Excellence Conference, which has been held for over a decade. But this really is, it, it feels like a new beginning. Um, the theme of this evening is navigating the virtual world, as, as um, Elise said. The ultimate goal of our gathering, as uh, the, the uh, MDI have, have said, is to open up a dialogue on topics of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and foster an anti-racist community of scholars. Now I ask you, what could be a more important or timely goal for our school? In setting this up, the Diversity Initiative members have placed their organization at the heart of the Macaulay community this year. This is a year like no other. It has revealed dreadful aspects of American society that have always been present by ignored by too many. The silver lining is that no one is able to look away or pretend that systemic racism does not manifest in every American institution. All of us must reflect deeply and consider how our societal structures reinforce racial inequality. We can no longer abide by the status quo. We must take action to create a new society that recognizes the effects of slavery and systemic inequality. We must free ourselves, all of us, from this poisonous legacy. Um, as I wrote earlier this year, the first step has been to acknowledge the violence of racism in this country and the terror it evokes in people of color. I'd like to see ultimately our entire nation engage in a process of truth and reconciliation and reparation. And I believe that will happen because there are enough people of goodwill to make it so. In the meantime, let us demand an end to inequitable treatment by race from the deadly physical violence inflicted by police to the attacks on health and livelihoods caused by discriminatory policies. At Macaulay, let us show our solidarity and respect for one another by acknowledging that racial bias and police brutality are realities for black members of our loving community of scholars. As Dr. Martin Luther King said, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. No one should be silent during this time. I so appreciate the ways that the Macaulay Diversity Initiative is moving with energy and great specificity in providing our community with educational opportunities like this one, guidance in our recruitment efforts at Macaulay and more. They've inspired me to work on specific actions as well. I'd like to quickly mention a few of them that have been launched since this past spring. Uh, first up, uh, the bias reporting form. Macaulay does not tolerate any kind of discrimination or mistreatment in person or online, on campus or off campus. That's why I wanted to make sure that any such instance could be quickly reported directly to my office. And so that I could then act quickly and take responsibility for the response of our, our community. Um, we've created something called the Justice and Equity Honors Network. This is a new uh, concentration 
that we hope to have started by next fall. It's in partnership with Arizona State University's Urban Campus at Phoenix, their honors, their Barrett Honors College, Phoenix. And uh, the idea is for people who are committed to issues of justice and equity to have a course of study that uh, they can connect together, not just courses, but we hope uh, back when the COVID-19 is behind us to have an annual conference, but really to uh, bring together people with this uh, both uh, a, a moral and a, an academic interest. We're revising the Macaulay Strategic Plan. It was just, uh, the ink's still a little wet. It was uh, finished uh, this past spring, but uh, it really became apparent that we needed to have a, a complete um, review of every aspect of it through the anti-racist lens. And uh, the kickoff meeting of the subcommittee um, that's going to tee up language for all of us to look at, at this, that will be on the uh, strategic plan page of, of Macaulay website, um, they had their kickoff last Friday and um, they're, they're all set to go on that. And, um, and so uh, we can really have very explicitly our anti-racist plan of action. The staff and faculty have begun self-examination uh, to be assisted by outs outside expert counsel. And then um, most importantly, expansion actually uh, improving our recruitment with help from the, the, uh, the diversity initiative and also extending the acceptance of transfer students by um, having raised the funds and now starting to uh, recruit uh, CUNY Community College members uh, for uh, next year. Um, we're improving the content of the city seminars to reflect Black and Latinx interests and concern. Um, we've uh, created new content and course descriptions reflecting that. And uh, I want to just uh, tell you about a wonderful culminating event, excuse me, for Seminar One, uh, Arts in the City, but it's also a launch event for the Justice and Equity Honors Network. It's a performance of Antigone and Ferguson just for the Macaulay community and the Arizona State community together watching. Uh, it's starring, believe it or not, Jumani Williams, um, Corey Hawkins uh, from Fresh Out of Compton, Tate Donovan, and Moses Ingram, who plays uh, Jolene in The Queen's Gambit, if you're watching that series. Antigone, of course, is a play by Sophocles written in 440 BC or thereabouts. Amazingly, it raises many issues important to us today. Fate versus free will, laws versus justice, moral law versus man-made law, divine law versus human law, civil disobedience, the politics of power, women's rights, and citizenship versus family loyalty. Actors will read from the script and there'll be live choral music performed by a diverse choir from New York City and St. Louis singing together. Afterwards, there's going to be a discussion among our community with the actors, the director, some mothers who have lost children to police violence. And we hope we will have a powerful discussion about racialized violence, police brutality, systemic oppression, gender-based violence, health inequality, and social justice. Please attend and bring your parents and friends. There's no charge and no limit on attendees. So you can register on the Macaulay website. It's December 3rd, the evening of December 3rd. And over the long term, we're building a diverse faculty with Black and Latinx members, starting with Mexican-American writer Carmen Buyosa. I hope some of you will sign up for her course next semester on Latin American literature. I'm thrilled the Macaulay Diversity Initiative invited assembly member Khalil Anderson to address us this evening. I heard the assembly member speak at a nonpartisan presidential debate watching party this past fall, hosted by the CUNY Coalition for Students with Disabilities. You're all in for a treat and inspiration about the importance of civic engagement. I'd like to thank again our hosts, the Macaulay Diversity Initiative for inviting me to speak and for creating a beautiful, timely and useful event for the community. Uh, Elise. Thank you so much, Dean Crowell for your words. So what we've all been waiting for, I'm super excited to announce Khalil, Assemblyman Khalil Anderson um, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary, Marie Ellis. I hope I got that right. Uh, and to all the uh, attendees this evening, I, I want to give you a special thank you uh, for, for dedicating your time and, and, and this moment uh, to really foster inclusion, uh, to really uh, be able to build uh, spaces uh, that you know fights to, to end racism, 
uh, all across the, our city, state, and country. Uh, and, and, and the space that you all are creating as young people, students, advocates to further pursue racial justice in our society that's going through a, a moment of, of, of confusion, a moment of, of pain and hurt and frustration. I hope folks can hear me well. This is my first time on my assembly computer in my assembly office, so I'm still getting a little used to uh, all of this, and uh, I'm, I'm honored to be back in this space to speak to students uh, about the importance of activism. So I'll talk a little bit about myself, and, and I'll talk about the journey, uh, and then I'll, I guess I can open up to, to hear some of the students. Uh, and yeah, I'm super excited to be here tonight. So my name is Khalil, Khalil M. Anderson. Uh, you know, I'm the assembly member for District 31. Uh, it covers the beautiful neighborhoods of Rosedale, Springfield Gardens, the Rockaway Peninsula, and South Ozone Park, a very diverse district um, with folks of color from all around the globe. Uh, and it's a great honor to be able to um, show up here every morning, every day, uh, to be able to fight uh, for working class families who are struggling to put their communities and lives back together uh, after COVID-19, who struggled after Superstorm Sandy, which greatly impacted our district, and, and, and just each and every day trying to fight to make sure they can do the best uh, for their families. And so I started out as an organizer and activist. Uh, my mom it runs in the blood a little bit there. My mom uh, was an organizer uh, for 1190, uh, for uh, ACORN, and my father was an organizer for 1199. Uh, so we, we come from a grassroots community organization space. Uh, and, you know, that's that's what I wanted to, to do in my career, you know, uh, coming out of college. And I didn't expect to land here in politics, but certainly wanted to be able to be in a space um, that I could make a difference. Uh, so I got my start as an organizer with the Rockwell Youth Task Force. I organized, uh, you know, as a as an intern. Uh, for Ready Rockaway, which is an emergency preparedness organization right here in my district. And also, I've been organizing with several uh, nonprofit groups uh, and organizations all across the Rockaway Peninsula in my time uh, coming through high school and college. So it was an opportunity for me to build relationships, uh, to grow with the community, uh, and to really, really be able to represent folk in a grassroots, uh, genuine, inter interpersonal way. Uh, and so being raised in the Rockaway Peninsula, faced with all the issues that we struggle with here in the Rockaways, gun violence, the issues of food access, the issues of transportation and lack thereof, the issues of lack of higher education, right? Uh, I did some research and recently, you know, as running, I was able to be able to pinpoint some of those issues that really stem from why the reasons folks can't move up uh, in this district. And everyone knows that the key to upward mobility, or excuse me, one of the keys to upward mobility is being able to have access to higher education. And, and sadly, my district doesn't have that. My district struggles uh, with, with access to higher education. In fact, just a quarter uh, of the folks who live in this district uh, are able to attain higher education. And that's a crisis. That's an equity, that's a lack of access. And that needs to be repaired. And that's something that we're gonna focus on in my tenure uh, serving you in the legislature. Uh, I'm a CUNY guy. I went through, uh, well, public school all around, K through 16, uh, which has been an honor because I have the opportunity to be able to work with diverse populations of, of folks from all around the globe. Uh, I came in as a Sikh student and struggled uh, I'm sure you all have heard of senioritis uh, in the senior year of high school, and that carried over into my first year uh, as a college student, and I didn't take it serious. I ended up failing four out of the five classes um, that I took in my freshman year. Uh, and, you know, everyone knows as well as a student, it's really hard to right the ship uh, when you do poorly early on. Uh, and so, you know, I had the greatest amount of supports around me from the Sikh program, uh, being, an EO, uh, being a Sikh student, having uh, academic advisors and, and having um, the access to, to guidance counseling to be able to share my pain and struggles, being a freshman, the pressure of having to do a 10 page paper uh, and waiting until the last minute to do it, something that I struggled with, um, 
at the time as a, as a freshman, uh, but being able to learn and grow and build with the faculty uh, within CUNY and within the Queens College SEEK program in particular was really, really what was pivotal uh, for me to get through college uh, and to take it more serious uh, and to understand the importance of higher education. Uh, so that was a great honor to, to, to be in that space. And so uh, I couldn't stop myself from organizing. I couldn't just organize in my neighborhood. Um, I organized uh, while on campus. And so I became a member of the Cultural and Political Affairs Committee for Student Association at Queens College. And we organized events that sought to engage folks on the civics level, not just talking about presidential, not just talking about gubernatorial, but local, 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 so people can understand the impact of state assembly member or the impact of a state senator uh, has on communities of color, communities that are struggling, uh, communities that are academically disadvantaged. Uh, and so that was an honor to be able to bring resources to the college and to bring resources to the community around higher education. When I was a student at Queens College, I wasn't sure what I was going to major in, y'all. I was confused. Um, I, I, I knew that I didn't want to be a career politician. I didn't want to go into politics directly. But I just wanted to do something impactful to be able to help others. Something, uh, whether it was in the non nonprofit sphere, uh, whether it was starting my own business that helps uh, people who are struggling. Uh, but I know that what I wanted to do after college was service-based. And so I landed on the urban studies uh, program at Queens College. Urban studies is interdisciplinary. You're studying sociology, you're studying psych, uh, you're studying um, sometimes uh, economics is in there. Uh, but you're, the, the key thing about urban studies is that you're studying people. You're studying how people interact in the urban, how people interact uh, in spaces where there are so many different types of people around and how to do that effectively. And so, you know, that was a great honor to be able to learn and grow and, and, and also learn about urban planning and how our neighborhoods are being planned for us without us. And so we have to enforce uh, the need to have a voice at the table uh, for people who are otherwise marginalized. Talk a little bit about my experience uh, running for public office. I was finishing up finalizing uh, a degree in the urban studies uh, program that I was in. And I read a newspaper article and newspaper article said that there's a vacancy uh, for a local office. And generally, you don't just read a newspaper article and just say, oh, I'm gonna run for office. But I really wanted to, I have, I have had a lot of ideas on how we can better unite the neighborhood and, and my experience as a community leader and organizer um, with, with the organizations I mentioned and the groups uh, on the ground, uh, being able to del deliver service, being able to plan for our neighborhoods, because uh, that's what we did with Ready Rockway, being able to plan emergency you know, preparedness mechanisms and techniques for our neighborhood that struggles with that. And so being able to have my ears on the ground, uh, uh, it really propelled me to be able to have the space um, to, to, to stand up and, and, and step up for people who otherwise did not have those opportunities here in the Rockways and all across the district. And so uh, I decided to run uh, when I was finishing up a degree at Queens College. Um, some of the things that we fought for were environmental issues, uh, making sure that we have access to uh, resources that can improve, improve in my environmental negatives, right? So when you have a community that's faced with environmental racism and environmental justice community um, that may have additional dumping, uh, increase of air pollution, increases of just general environmental negatives, you wanna make sure um, that you're advocating on the front lines for folks uh, who you know, and also live in coastal communities like here in the Rockaways uh, to be able to have those critical, critical conversations about how do we work to improve the conditions for people on the ground. And so, um, that was one issue we fought on. We also fought for transportation justice, making sure that a community that is as diverse as the 31st, a community that has the world's airport, JFK, at the heart of it, uh, people can actually get to it uh, and get to the heart of the district. And that's something that's struggled, and that's what we struggle with as a district. And so, you know, these are the things that we stood on. And of course, making sure that we can reallocate resources um, from law enforcement. Uh, and from spaces 
so that we can invest back into community. So we're addressing the root cause of issues, right? A lot of what we see in government is addressing symptoms. But when do we ever get the opportunity to address the root cause? The reason why a young man decides to join a gang rather than uh, go to school or get a trade. Uh, the reason why someone struggles um, with identity uh, in school and, and not why you know, they're, they're being attacked or bullied, let's address it early on. This is, what I, this is the things that we had, discussions that we had with voters, people in the community about the things and ways we can really work to address root cause. Yes, it takes longer to address root cause, but at least we know that we're doing something and pushing things in the right direction and not addressing symptoms as we see as they pop up as they go along. Uh, and so those are the things that I've been, you know, working towards uh, in our campaign of, of, of bringing unity and bringing togetherness. And so a campaign slogan was a new fight together because we truly believe that a district that is as geographically and politically isolated uh, as the 31st can come together on issues that we all hold near and dear, issues that we care so much about, and, and the importance of representation for a district that has so long lacked uh, adequate representation uh, in the sense of fighting on progressive values, people, things that people care and love about, uh, ways that we can improve conditions for working class families. Running for office was quite the experience. Um, being a young candidate, being 22 years old when I first declared uh, being elected at 24, uh, it certainly has had its ups and downs. Um, I, I, but I have to say and credit a lot of my success um, to young people, a lot of uh, success to 20 something year olds and 18 something year olds, 14 something year olds, right? Can I say that? Um, who took the leap of faith, believed in me, trust in, our, trust in my vision uh, for this district of building a new fight together. Uh, we organized nearly 60 volunteers um, to go out and give literature and uh, social distance, of course, to participate in our events, uh, to, to help with our digital campaign that we had on social media. Um, you know, running a COVID campaign really, really required uh, a technique of creativity uh, and really, really required thinking outside of the box. We held a weekly uh, program called Kick It With Khalil, where we were actually talking and reaching out directly to voters, reaching out to local leaders, uh, uh, and reaching out to people who otherwise would not be in uh, spaces of political discourse to bring to them a message of unity, bring to them a message uh, that, we, that we need fighters. We need people who are gonna be on the front lines protecting our communities, because if we're not in that room, if we're not discussing these issues, then no one else will for us. And so that's an important piece that, that led our campaign to victory um, and, and was able to unify a district, again, that's politically and geographically isolated. So I, I, wanna, I wanna, as I close out, I really just wanna give uh, some, some, some strong calls to action uh, to the young people, um, to the Macaulay Honor students, uh, to the CUNY students who are on this call today. Um, the importance of getting organized and getting folks behind you, getting a, a message in your community and being able to tackle the issues that you find near and dear to you. There are millions of issues that are impacting my district, impacting our city, state, and nation, and the globe. But I, I, I want to advise you to pick an issue that you care about the most. Pick an issue that, that, that sits well with your heart. Pick an issue um, that you could see yourself spending 20, 30, 40 hours plus a week on. And whether it's educating yourself on it, whether it's uh, organizing around it, pick that issue, run with it, uh, and build out your, your knowledge base on it and, and be able to inspire others uh, to build out their knowledge base on that issue. I think that that's vitally important to be able to change minds and hearts. And I think it's vitally important for you to be able to help yourself learn and grow. Seek mentors, resources, and other opportunities that will really guide you through that process. I could not be anywhere where I am today without having guidance counselors, without having paraprofessionals in high school, middle school, without having that shoulder to cry on and lean on when things were hard, when things were confusing, when things were tough. Uh, as someone who struggled uh, uh, early on as a young person, um, you know, in, in middle school, 
uh, and in high school, I was diagnosed with emotional disturbance and ADHD. Um, so I was in the District 75 school system and struggling with, you know, uh, living with a disability and struggling with a disability, you know, you, 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 you sometimes don't want to be categorized and you don't want to be labeled and you feel this way or that way. So you don't go for help or you don't go for resources or, or you hide the things that you're struggling with. It only hurts you more and only suppresses the root of why uh, or what uh, you're facing in that moment. So I, I encourage all students to seek out that mentor, uh, find yourself uh, in, you know, internally, figure out what you know, purpose that you, you'd like to uh, project on the world around us and be humble, be smart, be kind, and understand that people remember. People remember uh, when, you, uh, when you struggle, uh, they remember uh, when you've built it and, you, and, and you've expanded upon what you were before, grown, uh, and, and they remember uh, when you were there for them. Uh, and so I, I would definitely have to attribute our election victory uh, to relationships, uh, people remembering when I was there for them uh, and supportive of them, not just because whatever, but it was the right thing to do. It was the right thing to stand up for public housing residents, the right thing to do uh, to fight for food justice in this community. It's the right thing to do to discuss emergency preparedness where no one else would. So I wanna thank uh, the organizers today um, for holding this event, uh, for allowing students uh, to be able to express themselves, to, to, to be a part of the Macaulay Honors Program uh, and really be a voice in this moment. So I wanna thank you all. And, if, if it's appropriate, open up to questions. Yes, thank you so much, Khalil. So for our participants to ask a question, all you have to do is just use the raise hand feature on their participants tab, and then I can um, unmute you to um, ask your question. I'm just trying to see this, like, uh, this is my first time using this computer, so I'm still learning. <laughs> so see me well? Yes. <laughs> okay, good. After all that talking. <laughs> okay, Christina, you can go. Uh, okay, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Christina. Hello. Uh, it's very nice to talk with you, assembly member. Absolutely. Um, so I've been thinking recently about how to be more I've thought about like how to be more active uh, in, uh, in, you know, in advocacy for uh, values and beliefs that I believe in. And, uh, you know, I, but I really have no prior sort of study of like law or, uh, or legislation or, or anything like that. And it just feels, it feels maybe like I'm too late or something like uh, to be able to, you know, um, be knowledgeable and like maybe even push myself towards becoming an elected fish official. You know, it's only because of like recent times that like, uh, you know, uh, I've been thinking this way. So I feel like maybe I'm just not ready for that. Like, uh, do you have any sort of advice for people who just don't have that kind of background off bat, but uh, want to try. Yeah, no, definitely, Christina. I want to thank you for, for sharing your story uh, and giving context to, to, to where you want to go. I think that if you want to get into law and you want to get into a space where you're able to create laws for others or advocate uh, in, in the public interest space, there are definitely many, many uh, spaces like uh, organizations uh, that are doing work uh, around the legal space, uh, whether whether it's criminal, whether it's uh, you know tax, whether it's any type of law. For example, a group that I've worked really closely with was Queens Defenders, and they're always looking for a young people who have a legal mind and an opportunity to be able to teach and learn and grow along that process. Secondly, I'll also recommend some of the advocacy groups and organizations that are doing legislative work right now all across the city and state. For example, you have Communities United for Police Reform. Is that, if that's something you're passionate about, I'd connect with that group because they're writing, they're literally helping the, in the process of legislating, helping in the process of making sure from point A to point B, we're writing legislation that's equitable and fair for all New Yorkers. Groups like Make the Road, uh, groups like um, the Rock Weave Task Force does things that are super hyper local. Um, so it might not be something that 
if, if you don't want to do the Rockaways, um, but <laughs> whatever area of focus, there is a group, uh, an organization. If there's not, we need you to start it. We need you to get out there on the front lines. It's not too late to start an organization. It's not too late to teach the next generation of young people who are looking to, to advance on this issue. So we need you. Definitely, there are groups and spaces for you to plug into. Even if you have three or four hours a day or a week or whatever, plug in into these groups will teach you things that you wouldn't learn in a college uh, a lecture hall, things you wouldn't learn in a classroom uh, because it's, it's lived experience. So I hope that answer your question, uh, answers your question, Christina. Yeah, it does. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And thank you thank for you facilitating, so um, Marie Ellis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine, for your question. Um, so right now we do have to move on to the panel, but I do encourage you to send your questions to Khalil's Instagram. I don't know if you can drop it in the chat for them to see, because I do see there are some hands up still. Um, that way he can get an answer to you. Um, and now I would just like to pass it over to Harleen. I'm gonna drop my email in the chat. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Elise. Uh, hi, everyone, my name is Harleen, and I'm excited to introduce our panelists, the Hunter graduates, Evelyn and Mel Melanie, and hear about their experiences and insight on joining an inclusive work envi environment. Uh, before we get into discussion, again, I will ask everyone to hold on to their questions till the end and we'll allow some time for Q&A. Uh, that being said, we're just gonna jump right in to start the conversation. I would love for our panelists, uh, Melanie or Evelyn, whoever wants to go first, to briefly introduce yourselves and also share how would you define an, as an inclusive work environment or culture? I'm not sure if I should go first or if I would like to go first. Uh -huh. uh, anyone can go first, yeah. Okay, I'll start. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Melanie Boyce, and I am a Macaulay Honors College grad from Hunter College. I um, graduated in 2013, um, and I brief career, um, career trajectory. I worked at a law firm for two years, um, and then I graduated in University of Oxford to theology. Um, and I came back to the States after a brief stint researching at the University of Cambridge's Judge Business School. Um, and I now work at NBC Universal as a diversity, equity, and inclusion analyst. Um, and to go with the first question, which is, I believe you said, it's what does um, an inclusive work environment or culture look like? Um, okay, so for me, um, being really in the weeds of the space and really, um, you know, wrestling with this question pretty much daily. Um, personally, for me, it's a workplace where you see yourself and you also hear yourself. So, you know, especially when you first join the workforce, um, it might be a little bit lonely, um, particularly if you're from an underrepresented group. Um, so I think it's really important to, you know, not only, you know, see people who um, look like you around you as your peers and in your current rank, but also see what the leadership looks like. Um, I find that a lot can be garnered from, you know, who are making the business decisions and the um, and are leading the company with to the future. Um, and if they are, if or not, they are representing you or representing people like you. Um, and also hearing yourself, because as great as it is to also see. Um, people in the space doing the work, you also want to make sure that they have a seat at the table and are actually contributing. Um, so those are kind of like my bare bones stepping stone um, foundation steps for kind of knowing what an inclusive work environment looks like. So I guess I'll jump right in. Hi guys, my name is Evelyn Perez Alvino. I am class of 2008. I want to say, yeah, that sounds about right. Um, I am a lawyer. I'm an employment lawyer. I went off to uh, Benjamin and Cardozo School of Law after Hunter and um, practiced at a law firm. I litigated for about four years before going in-house. I worked at um, a magazine publisher, Condé Nast. It's the publisher for Glamour, Allure, Vogue, um, and just last year I joined the legal department at JetBlue as director of the employment law group. Um, 
And so that's sort of a brief um, background on sort of my career trajectory. Um, like Melanie said, it's sort of sometimes hard to define or talk about um, what this space looks like when you're deep in it every single day. It's kind of sitting on your desk and you kind of assume and take for granted that everybody knows what you're talking about. Um, but I think to answer the first question at the most granular level, I would say um, you can innately feel what inclusion, whether, whether a space is inclusive, you can feel it. You can walk into an area and understand whether um, either your voice is heard, whether people see you entirely, whether you are welcomed there as your entire self, right? So it's it runs, a, I think, a pretty big spectrum. It can go from the most superficial things. So to give you guys an example here at JetBlue, um, it was a big deal. This happened before I got here, actually. Um, they have music or music, I guess, playing in the bathrooms, right? And it's the most silliest thing, but I walked in there one day and they were playing bachata. That's something that's never happened at a workplace like for me before, right? That happens when I walk into the cafeteria. It happens when I walk into a staff space, secretary space, right? Into the facilities room, that always happens. But to walk, you know, to be in corporate headquarters on the floor where my CEO sits and to walk into a space where everyone is, is you know, pretty high traffic and hear that, that felt amazing. So I felt that. Um, that wasn't a policy anywhere that wasn't written down in some book, but I felt it. Um, another uh, sort of um, example, I'm a young, I'm a new mom. I'm not a young mom, but I'm a new mom. Um, I have a two-year-old and now in the age of COVID with all these virtual meetings, I feel comfortable enough. I don't love it. It's still a pain and a nuisance, but my son gets in on these conference calls, right? It's sort of unavoidable. Um, and I don't feel uh, chastised for it. I'm not penalized for it. I don't feel like I have to um, overly apologize for the fact that that is my reality, that is my life, I am a mother. Um, and so those are two very, I think, superficial examples of how um, you can tell whether a space is inclusive by just kind of assessing how you feel about being yourself in that space. Thank you so much. I think that really ties along and kind of jumps into our next question, which talks about, yes, there is no clear definition, but it, are there any signs that accompanying DEI policies or initiatives are more than just service level and are actually impacting the organization and really inducing change within the organization? Should I start? Is it yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay, sure. So I think you want to look and listen when figuring out whether an organization is just kind of paying lip service to what their diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives might be. Um, one, you're going to sort of see not only what leadership looks like, but take a step back and see what your individual team looks like and what the company as a whole looks like. Because if, for instance, you might have an organization where it sort of looks like a triangle and a lot of them, a lot of them do, right? There's a lot of diversity um, at the bottom levels um, of the organization, the front facing levels of the organization and less so at the top. So then you can evaluate the, I think, public or outward commitments that that organization is making. Um, to see whether they're actually laying out initiatives to actually address that problem that everybody can see, right? It's, it's one thing to just sort of make kind of blanket statements about diversity being good, being the right thing to do. It's this great ideal that we should all strive for. Um, it's an entirely other thing to make tangible commitments to how you're going to get there. Um, and that's something that you can only really, not every organization does correctly, not every organization does 
thoughtfully. And a lot of that goes into who they have at the table deciding what those initiatives are going to look like and what that communication is going to look like. Um, so that's sort of the look part. Um, and the second I'd say is listen. Um, as employment counsel in some large organizations, I'm at the table when folks are talking about this stuff and when they're not. And there are a lot of times when it makes sense for, you know, the DEI person is there, they get five minutes of time, they explain what it is, and then sort of the entire meeting moves on. Um, when you're at a particular meeting, when the DEI person is not there and diversity comes up, that's a good sign. When diversity comes up from someone pretty high up in the chain, you know, the presentations happened, folks are talking about how they're gonna get something accomplished and top brass raises their hand and says, that's great, but what about this piece? What about the diversity commitments that we've made? If that's happening, that's a good look. Um, and I've been a lot of, in a lot of places where there's been sort of lip service to these high ideals, but those conversations are not happening. And if they're happening, they're kind of happening in a bubble. It's just the people that are in those teams that are involved in those conversations. That's not what you want. You want the entire organization to be weighing in. Um, and I guess I'll stop there so that Melanie can, can weigh in and we can keep going back and forth. <laughs> Cause I could keep going for like an hour. <laughs> oh, no, 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 I was completely interrupted. Um, um, because a lot of what Evelyn is saying um, is definitely some, some things that we definitely also discuss on my side, um, you know, just as she said, representation very much tapers with seniority. The higher up you get in the company, the less likely you are to find people um, who look like you or who you identify with. Um, so it's really important to see, you know, where the pipeline is, you know, see where your peers are, who is in the pool with you, and then check and see who's being promoted. And also, this is a really big thing that's coming up a lot too, like who is being, you know, kind of lured away um, because their talent. Um, that's something that you also want to be cognizant of and just make sure that you're doing. Oh. Um, another thing, oh, yes. Was it just me? I lost you for like half of like the last 30 seconds. You want to repeat what you just said? Absolutely. Where did you, where did I lose you guys? Uh, attrition. Oh, yes. So, um, you know, seeing who's leaving the company and who's being lured away, um, because that's a sign that, you know, the company's not doing a good job at developing and retaining the talent that they already have. Um, so those are things to look out for. But you also want to see um, a lot of companies have, you know, associate programs, summer analyst programs, um, things of that nature, where they bring in really diverse groups. Um, to get their feet wet, learn about the business. Um, and a lot of you guys are probably gearing up for those programs yourself. Um, I think it's really important to view and see who gets offers after those summer programs are over. Um, you know, who are they extending offers to? Um, and, you know, is, is, if we're talking like um, gender wise, is, are there only two women to eight men? Like things like that are a red flag. So you wanna make sure that you're, you know, viewing those things. Um, I'm thinking in terms of law, because I work at a law firm, um, you can easily go on um, a major law firm site and everybody's picture is up and you can see who the partners are. Um, for many corporate sites, you can go on their board of directors or their leadership staff and see who is there. Um, you know, and that, that's what I do um, as part of my job. Not only do I um, take a look at our um, makeup of our leadership team, but I also look at major leadership teams of our competitors um, just to see how we stack up and what's going on across the industry. So that's a really good way to kind of gauge and see what's going on at a surface level from the employee side. Um, from the, I guess, external um, partnership and communication side, um, I think it's really important to see, especially with a lot of statements being made um, over the summer, um, you know, just checking in with companies who have made these grand gestures and grand statements 
and seeing, you know, what's going on in terms of how their own employees are speaking about how they've been handling um, all of this um, that's been going on. Um, I, don't, I don't know about you guys, but I saw a lot of hashtags um, from um, like news organizations talking about their experiences. Um, I believe several YouTube um, shows had reckonings. Um, a lot of talk is being happened and people aren't being afraid to speak out and talk about their experience. So, you know, if you're interested in the industry and you see, you know, employees talking about an experience, very much listen in and check out the hashtags and see what's going on. I think that'll tell you a lot about what is going on and how um, companies are really um, addressing these issues. That's great. And uh, to kind of address recent events, uh, what in your opinion has changed recently in terms of DEI at work with the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement? Uh, uh, we can start with Melanie in this case, or uh, yeah, we'll start with Melanie. Sorry. Yeah, sure. Um, I think for one, um, I think when the Black Lives Matter movement was kind of starting out and really in its infancy in 2014, everybody was afraid to say it. And now it's the first statement you see um, when people are doing their press releases and giving out their statements. So I think in terms of, you know, just it not being a word or a hashtag to be afraid of, that's been a huge change. And seeing, um, you know, CEOs say Black Lives Matter, like that's a huge change that I saw. Um, in terms of what I've been seeing to address it, um, I'm, um, I guess personally, I've just been pretty, I've been approaching this pretty realistically in that, you know, a lot of companies want to make sure that they get their statements out um, so that their customer base and their fan bases and everybody knows that, you know, we do align with, you know, the current climate of what people are kind of, you know, I guess, discussing, agreeing with all of those things, you know, um, and what I like to see is, you know, after the statement has been made, I go back and check and see, you know, okay, if this is a clothing company, have they improved the optics of their Instagram page? Are there models of color? Um, are things like that happening? Um, release a statement and I believe came out with and it stated, okay, we're gonna be pledging $100 million to social justice organizations and racial justice organizations. And they laid out a plan for the, um, the five um, focus areas that we want to really address. Um, please let me know if I'm going in and out. It says my internet connection is unstable. Um, but that was really important to me because as important as it is to you know lay out the statement, state where you are and where you fall, um, I think it's equally as important to create actionable steps that people can view and track and go along with to see, um, you know, how exactly you're addressing this. Um, I think transparency is a big, um, a big component to see like what exactly is lip service and where people are actually making the change and making that commitment to change. I think on my end, uh, the biggest change that I've seen internally is momentum. Um, and that's sort of driven uh, not just by the optics of the moment and having the, the company sort of show the world that it is taking a stand and taking steps towards that. But in a lot of organizations, the DEI team is lean and mean and they aren't always given as much authority or empowered to drive change as quickly or where they see fit, right? It's really a, a partnering function and you kind of have to bring people along with you softly. Um, and so what this moment in time has done is created sufficient momentum that I think a lot of companies have realized they had previously disempowered their DEI teams um, and they're looking to quickly course correct on that now. What the motivation behind that might be depends on the company, right? Um, but I have noticed a shift in not only, um, not only 
the tone and the messaging that's being put out there, but just how quickly things are changing internally for the organizations that are really looking to drive change and that are actually committed. Um, so that I think would be the, the biggest shift. Um, and that's not to say that the teams are growing, right? Because it's we're in a time where resources are still lacking. Um, and so you can't, what you'd like to be able to do if you're going to empower a team or really commit to an initiative is be able to put you know, your money where your mouth is and add resources to that. Um, that's not the world that we're in right now. Certainly, for instance, not edge of blue. Um, because I picked a hell of a time to get into aviation. But, <laughs> um, but aside from the money, what, you know, is there power? Can that drive change? Who are those folks out talking to? Whereas before you'd have um, the initiative be largely programmatic, largely centered around, you know, a very necessary um, employee resource group that creates a safe space for folks, but doesn't necessarily drive change. It's just a safe space. Um, you're, you're seeing initiatives and programming broaden and broaden quickly to really make, to the extent folks are really committing to this, to really make actionable change. Um, that's, that's a piece that can't be missed because if you miss that window, if you think you're gonna empower your team in February of next year versus doing it since the summer, let's say, you should have been doing it all along, but that's not the reality we're living in. Um, you're gonna lose that because you're gonna lose for whatever, whatever it's worth, you've garnered the attention of both outside folks and inside top brass. And you don't want to be in a position where you're no longer um, sort of top of mind in terms of initiatives, in terms of resourcing, in terms of what needs to happen um, critically to drive change. If you wait till February, if you wait till, okay, let's do Q2 of next year, we're gonna slate this great initiative. You're gonna lose so much momentum in that. Um, and really lose an opportunity to have key stakeholders get involved, be uh, uh, necessary voices to make sure that message funnels through the entirety of your organization. You wait and it becomes a silo again. So that's, I think, what the biggest thing that has changed. Thank you so much for your response. Uh, from a time perspective, we're now gonna shift our questions from the students. So any attendees who have any questions, feel free to use the raise hand feature on a participants tab like we did before. And we will give you permission to unmute and speak. All right, Emmanuel, can you ask Hi. a question? Can everyone hear me? Yes. Hey everyone, this has been so illuminating. Um, my question has to do um, with a perspective. I am at a leadership position in a group that does not represent the broader institution I'm in. Um, the core group is, mo it's a student group. It's made up of honor students, mostly white upper middle class um, and you know there really isn't any diversity there and I want to bring more people in um, and I want to make this group better represent the institution I'm in. Um, I'm wondering what are some steps you wish that leadership took um, when you weren't yet in positions of powers in the institutions and organizations that you participated in? Yeah, um, feel free to jump in. Evelyn, do you want to start? I'm not sure if this applies in your particular scenario, so please correct me if it's not the case. Um, I've found that the moments where I felt less seen is when my leaders were also not bringing their full selves to the table. Um, part of what I try to do now, even in being, you know, part of something like this or in my day-to-day -day meetings with my colleagues is being unapologetically myself and 
reminding people of what that looks like. There are times where it's a lot of chaos in the back. You know, I happen to be in the office today, um, but usually I'm at home with a running kid and my husband's working. So he's on the phone on the other side and there's a lot going on on my end. I'd probably rather not be on video, but I know that there are people for whom it is important to see me and what I look like on video to remember that I'm also one of the people at that table and for, for lack of a better term, lower level folks on my team to see that they can also strive for that and succeed in that. Um, um, so I, I sort of, go ahead. I'm so sorry. Um, I feel I may not have expressed this um, very well. Um, okay. I'm actually within that group. I am uh, part of two institutions that um, have historically been made up of people who look like me um, and in part for structural reasons, like for example, the debate society, debate is a very elitist activity um, and it is very white um, and it is difficult for an institution like CUNY to break into that space and even more difficult for people of color um, historically when we have um, like had members, it's been difficult to retain them because the atmosphere has been so racist when we go to tournaments. Um, and mm. for obviously multivariate reasons. And then for the second group I'm in, it's a youth enfranchisement group. So we're trying to represent CUNY and all of its interests. And one of the obstacles I had when I was recruiting people for it was who had time to participate and who didn't. And um, I feel as though to continue to represent CUNY, um, these institutions have to look like CUNY and I'm wondering what I can do in my power to make that happen. Um, so sorry to interrupt. Um, we are run out of time, unfortunately, but I do encourage both Melanie and Evelyn to reach out to Manuel separately and really answer his question. Um, however, we are at 630 and we do need to move on. So that being said, thank you so much to, for the panelists to, for um, joining our event today. And if any other questions that any panelists have, feel free to reach out to them separately. That being said, uh, I'm gonna pass it on to Elise to introduce the next portion of the event. Thank you so much, Harleen. Thank you again, Evelyn and Melanie for coming to speak with us today. Um, so thank you everyone for coming to the first portion of the Supporting Excellence Conference. Um, student workshops are now open to attend for the second half of today's conference. Um, and to navigate to the um, Club Macaulay event page to find the Zoom link, which is being in the chat right now. Um, and before you go, um, I just wanna say is we are raffling off seven different t-shirts. So we're making sure everyone's in the workshops so that way we can gather your name. And at 12 p.m. tomorrow at the Macaulay Diversity um, Instagram, we'll be going live to raffle um, the t-shirts with like a spinning wheel. Uh, thank you again, everyone. Um, and thank you to our panelists again. Thank you to Khalil. Thank you to all of Macaulay's staff, especially Diversity Initiative as well as Scholars Council. Thank you guys.